Hello, welcome to chapter 4, Demand and Supply. In segment 2 of the basic module, we will talk about assumptions, competitive markets and price takers. In the last segment, we covered how important assumptions are in general. Here in segment 2, we will cover three main topics and all three topics are indirectly or directly related to assumptions. In the first topic, we will talk about assumptions which apply to the whole course and which additional assumptions we use for a competitive market. Finally, in the third topic, we will learn what the term price taker means. Let's first talk about assumptions which are valid for the entire course. The first assumption is that we analyze the market for one good. What we mean by the term one good is not as unambitious as it sounds. For now, let's not elaborate on this problem and assume we analyze the market for high quality wheat, which is called Q plus quality by the Washington Wheat Commission. The second assumption states that buyers have no preference towards a producer. For example, Q plus wheat is valued by consumers in the same way, no matter if it is produced by Farmer C in California or by Farmer T in Texas. The third assumption is similar to the second. While we assumed in the second basically that all producers are the same, we assume in the third assumption that all goods in the market are exactly the same. In assumption number four, we assume we have many buyers or many demanders, which is the same in the market, and they all want potentially to buy the good. The fifth assumption states that buyers or demanders have to take the price as it is and decide on this base which quantity of good they are willing to buy. If you don't believe this, try the following experiment. Go to your neighborhood supermarket and try to negotiate for the price of milk. You will not be very successful with this experiment. The supermarket can sell the milk to one of the other many buyers. Therefore, the supermarket does not have to negotiate with you. Here's a warning. Be careful with this experiment because the supermarket might think you're insane and they might call the police. Since we will apply the assumptions we discussed to our entire course, we will here take a look at the implication of our assumptions. Let us start with the first assumption. We analyze the market for one good. As we mentioned already, the term one good is not unambitious. If we, for example, analyze the market for cars, what do we actually mean by cars? Maybe we mean all cars, including SUVs, sports cars and trucks. Or do we mean only SUVs? Or even more specific, maybe we want to analyze the markets for red F-150s pickups from Ford. The more specific we are, the more realistic is our assumption of one good. But on the other side, the less general is our analysis. How narrow or how broad we define the term car depends on what we want to analyze. Here are some examples. For general traffic research, the broad definition all cars might be just fine. In contrast, if Ford wants to learn about how well the F-150 pickup truck is doing in the market, they might conduct two analyses. One, where they define car as a pickup truck the size of an F-150, and one where they consider only the F-150 as a car and then compare the results. All these matters are very important for research. For our purpose, we can ignore the problem and assume the good we analyze is somehow clearly defined. The other assumptions also have implications. For example, number two, buyers have no preference towards a producer. This is a strong assumption since we know that there are actually differences, such as how friendly or unfriendly the service is, 
or how reliable the producers are or how far the consumer is living from the producer. By saying no preference towards a producer, we neglect all these differences, pretending all producers are the same. The same is true for assumption number three. All goods in the market are the same. We neglect quality differences, performance differences, and all other differences related to the good. Assumption number four, the assumption many buyers want potentially to buy the good, we call this assumption many demanders, implies no buyer has negotiation power, since there are so many potential buyers in the market. The implication of the last assumption together with the other assumptions makes the price the most important determinant for a consumption decision. If a consumer has no reason to buy from a specific supplier, they are all the same. If all goods in the market are the same, and if he or she has no power to change the price, then the best thing to do is observe the price, accept the price as it is, take the price as it is, and decide how much she or he wants to buy. This is actually assumption number five. Buyers are price takers. The third and the last topic actually deals with competitive markets. If we consider a competitive market, we have to add some further assumptions. First, in a competitive market, we have many suppliers. Therefore, none of the suppliers has actually market power. Second, in a competitive market, the price mechanism always ensures that demand and supplied quantities are exactly the same. Since we don't know yet how the price mechanism works, we assume that an invisible hand always sets the price in a way that demanded quantity equals supplied quantity. Adam Smith, the father of market economy, used the concept of the invisible hand to explain markets to his students in the 18th century. Therefore, we will use this explanation until we learn the details of the price mechanism. We learned from the second assumption that suppliers can't coordinate their action because there are just too many suppliers. This means they can't influence the market price either. Therefore, each individual supplier takes the market price as it is. Or with other words, suppliers are price takers. They take the price for granted. Based on the observed price, they will decide how much they want to produce. Let's challenge the third assumption to see if it makes sense. Maybe a producer wants to lower her price to sell more. No, that does not make sense. The invisible hand sets the price in a way that demand is equal supply. Therefore, the producer can anyway sell whatever she produced. Why should she lower her price? What if she produces more? Would she have to lower her price now in order to be able to sell her extra product? No, since we have so many other producers. Her extra production would not influence the market price. Even if our company would double its production, the overall increase in market supply would be so small that the market would not even recognize the increase. What follows, even if a single company increases or even doubles its production, the supply will be not affected, the market price will not be affected. If a producer under no circumstances influences the market price, then the best thing for the producer to do is observe the market price, take the market price as it is, and then decide how much to produce given the current market price. In this segment, we learned about the assumptions that we will apply for the whole course. We also learned about assumptions for competitive markets. Do you remember the assumptions for the whole course and the assumptions for a competitive market? Then stop the presentation here, write them down, and when you're done, start the presentation again to see if you were right or not.
Okay, let's start with the assumptions for the whole course. You should have at least three of the four assumptions. First, buyers have no preference towards a producer. Second, all goods are exactly the same. Third, the market consists out of many buyers, many demanders. And fourth, buyers are price takers. From the three additional assumptions for a competitive market, you should at least remember two. Here they are. Many producers or many suppliers. None of the suppliers has market power. Producers are price takers. Hope you get them all right.